Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Reference Point. I'm your host, Dave Cokerhook. This evening, we're going to be talking about, uh, I think, a very timely subject. And we're actually going to do two episodes on this topic, to, in, in this one and in, in for next week. And it has to do with campaign finance reform. You know, we're, we're here in the month of August when we're taping this, and we've got the midterm elections coming up, and there's a lot of discussion about the whole concept of what's happening with with uh, the funding of political campaigns, both in with respect to the individuals that are at a state and national level, but also with respect to um, the initiatives or referendums and other ballot measures that, that are voted on by state and local uh, activities. So with me today, I have three guests that I'm really excited to hear, and I'll introduce my guests in the studio first. I have... Um, uh, Eitan Fenson, that's that was it. Eitan. Eitan. Eitan Fenson, who is here representing uh, two organizations, one Move to Amend, which we'll talk about in an, another minute, and the other one was... Yes on CA49. Yes on CA49. And uh, also with me here, Craig uh, Dunkerley, who's with the California Clean Money Campaign. Craig? Yep, great to be to here. Pleasure to have you here. Thanks. And joining us f all the way from Boston, Massachusetts, via Skype, is Selena Gray, who's the Chief Operating Officer for the May Day Political Action Committee. Selena, welcome. Here. Thank you. So now I'm going to start the discussion with you, Selena, because you've been involved with several different organizations that I'm aware of, uh, the Root Strikers, uh, Demand Progress, and now May Day PAC. And maybe you can kind of start our discussion associated with uh, campaign finance reform by talking about your activities and how all these three things, these organizations have kind of come together into the uh, political, ac political action committee. If I can say that <laughs> fast, <laughs> times I'll be in good shape. So over to you. So I, I would say first that we don't say campaign finance reform. We say ending the system of corruption. Um, and by we, I mean Lawrence Lessig uh, and the various organizations that he has started that I have had the great fortune of working with, including Root Strikers uh, and now Mayday PAC. So our work at Mayday PAC, I, I think you're right in saying, is sort of a culmination of those efforts. Um, and it's focused primarily on impacting the election cycle. It's called an ironic super PAC. We're raising and spending money in order to um, impact elections to uh, elect a Congress that will be committed to this issue in 2016. Some say that this is a moonshot strategy. Some say that it's a little bit ironic because we are trying to raise big money to defeat big money. Um, but I think that it's just a natural progression of, of this movement and where it's come to. People are fed up. People no longer want to talk about strategies that feel uh, unsustainable or that feel a little bit hard to grasp. I think people in this movement, people who've been working around this movement, know that we're at a critical point right now that there are some common sense solutions we could all embrace. Um, and whether you are interested in advocacy or activism or legal remedies or you want to start a super PAC, uh, I think everybody wants to do something. And I think that that's sort of where we are right now in 2014. And that's why I think Mayday PAC is so special. Well, well let's take a, kind of a, a macro look at this concept or this topic for a moment. Because you, you mentioned something in terms of the there's a lot of um, disgruntlement regarding s scenarios as they are right now, but I think it might be helpful to to state the obvious, maybe, but what are the situations relative to the challenges with how money is implemented and accessed in politics today? Who wants to start on that one? I would, I would love to start with that one. <laughs> I'm sure everybody would love to start with that one. Um, but I, I think you can you can pretty much pick any issue that you care about, whether or not it's tax reform on the right, um, responsible fiscal policy, or climate change, or access to health care, or even you know on a local level raising the minimum wage, and you can point to the way in which corporations, special interests, wealthy donors have bought and sold politicians and and prevented really really basic critical problems in our society from being solved. Um, I think that that's the way that most people uh, engage with this issue or understand this issue principally is is not necessarily how do I care about campaign finance reform or why do I care about campaign finance reform, but you know why can't I afford the asthma medication that my child needs in order to survive or why can't I afford uh, the same produce at the grocery store because prices are climbing so high. I think that um, every single issue comes down to this issue. Yeah, I mean, we, we often say, uh, you know, in, in the movement that what whatever 
the cause is that you care about uh, wherever you are on the political spectrum, that uh, the, the kinds of uh, changes that you might like to see in, in, in government, the kind of things that uh, you might like to see happening uh, that would be more in the public interest uh, are, are all going to be more difficult to accomplish uh, until we reduce, if not eliminate, uh, the impact of private money in politics. Uh, it just taints everything. Uh, I, I like to, to tell people that uh, whatever your cause is, we need to fix this first, meaning the money in politics and the influence that it has. Uh, it's terribly corrupting. It, money has always been something that's, that's linked to political activity. I don't think there's ever been a time uh, when, when that hasn't been the case. In this country? Well, not just in this country. I think the, the moneyed in, um, mm -hmm. um, groups or individuals or, or whatever, uh, you, throughout history, if you had the resources and it t tended to boil down to wealth, whatever wealth was defined as at, at any point in time, then those groups, individuals, whatever, had the greatest influence. Yeah. So what, if anything, is different about the influence of money in today's politics than what we had, say, 100 years ago? Well, I would say one thing that strikes, uh, strikes me as prominent, it's almost as if the situation we're in now is out of some parody. If you look at how much time our representatives spend raising money versus actually doing their jobs, if you graph the trend, number of hours per week, it's going up and up and up in favor of money to the point where you can imagine the trend going so all they do is is raise money and do nothing in the way of government so uh, I think that that in some sense really highlights how uh, how absurd we uh, the situation that we find ourselves in right now um, I've talked to a number of elected representatives who have expressed exactly that sentiment uh, our local congresswoman Anna issue uh, <laughs> That, that's almost all she talks about, mm -hmm. how frustrating it is for her that she has to spend so much time raising money. She can't do her job. Right. I think, and that, that's a key component. Matter of fact, Selen, I think that's something that one, my first interaction with this whole concept was through something, a, a, a book that I read that uh, Lawrence Lessig had written about uh, um, money, and, and, and that was a key point. The amount of time that, that our elected officials need to spend in order to make sure that they have the war chest to be able to get reelected. Uh, do we have any statistics that tie to percent of time or anything like that that anybody knows of? We do. There's a, there's a rough estimate that's been going around for the last couple of years that says that um, 30 to 70 percent of a congressperson's time is spent dialing for dollars. But there was this huge controversy in the last election cycle um, where we had, uh, I think, a, a memo for freshman members of Congress uh, that, that basically said specifically that they should be spending at least four to five hours a day dialing for dollars, just straight up calling people to ask for money, in addition to attending fundraisers and um, otherwise just being tuned into fundraising. And you have to imagine that when you're spending uh, you know, between five and God knows how many hours a day asking people for money, you sort of develop the sixth sense. This is all that you can probably think about. Um, so rather than spending time thinking about the issues or constituencies, um, you know, people in Congress are basically trained to just think about money and to focus on that entirely. Okay, I so think that's the source of the, the problem for sure. So that leads me to, to two questions, two things that, that pop out right away at me when we talk about the amount of time that a congressperson is spending on that. One, who's writing the laws, okay, <laughs> and then, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And then two. That's easy. <laughs> <laughs> and, and how much do they really know about what it is they're voting on? The, the elected officials. Those yeah. are the right questions. Yes. Um, I don't know if you know about ALEC. I don't remember the exact <laughs> the exact uh, acronym, but uh, it is a American Legislative Exchange Council. American Legislative Exchange Council. Okay. Thank you, Craig. Um, this is a nonprofit corporation that is funded by large American, large international corporations that whose sole purpose it is to advise our representatives on writing laws. Mm -hmm. And in reality, they end up writing the laws. Um, very many of our laws are written, I'll, I would say, I, I won't say most of them because I don't know that for sure. But a lot of them are written by lobbyists mm -hmm. and organizations like ALEC. 
uh, more and more so. This is a trend that is increasing. It's not getting better. Mm -hmm. um, and to the point where the laws that are being written, as you point out, sometimes these legislators haven't even read them. They vote on the laws because they trust that the people who are paying them <laughs> are doing what they should be doing. Right. Uh, and uh, I think that's a, a tremendous problem that we have. So that tells me that, that the, uh, the system, the representative democracy that, that we have, in sense, you vote for someone to go to Congress as a senator or, or, or congressperson, and both at the state level and, and at a, uh, a federal level, um, these, guys, these people are going there with incredibly good intentions, and then they get there and all of a sudden they find that, that they can't do what it was that they were hoping to accomplish because they really have to devote what, what, somewhere between 30 and 70 percent of their time. If they're doing four to five hours a day, that's an awful lot of time a day, trying to prepare themselves to be able to win the next election. And I'm going to guess that the party leadership has a lot to do with the focus in that direction because they're juxtapositioning to make sure they have the majority in the House or the Senate and that sort of thing. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, I think part of the good news here is that the, the, uh, one, of the, one of the few things that a lot of legislators and elected officials can agree on from all over the political spectrum is that this is increasingly one of the things that they hate the most. Right. <laughs> they don't really get to do their job. They, they, they don't really get to go there and do to make the whatever sort of difference they wanted to make right. because they have to spend so much time doing this. And, and I think there's a, a couple of key things that affect this. One is that the reason they have to spend all this time doing this is because the source of the money is private. It's, right. from, it's from private sources. That's, that's, that's one problem. Uh, as opposed to if it were publicly uh, uh, funded, then they wouldn't. They could spend their time legislating. They wouldn't have to spend their time right, raising money. The, the money the is just there. The, the other thing that's that's exacerbated the problem that, as you say, has been here forever. Money in politics has been here forever. But what's really exacerbated it in the last 10, 20 years, are unfortunately a series of uh, U.S. Supreme Court decisions that have just blown up whatever regulation and, and efforts that we had to, to limit or regulate uh, the, the amount of money that sloshing around in our system. Uh, they've just opened the floodgates open up on this and it, and it keeps getting worse. You know, mm -hmm. the, the most recent one was the McCutcheon decision and, and it's just, uh, the decisions they're making are vastly, uh, by many times, by factors, you know, increasing the amount of money in politics and the money's still coming from private sources. Right. So those two things conspire together to force our elected officials to spend inordinate amounts of their time doing that instead of, um, instead of legislating. So with respect to the concept of lobbying, um, it seems that one of the, 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 the concept of lobbying um, is a valid concept in that you have uh, a, a, an interested constituency that wants to make their scenario understood so that the elected officials <coughs> can take that into consideration when doing their job. Okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And to do that, somebody has to be paid <coughs> to go and do that. But I guess the challenge becomes what then? The, the, the problem, I, I, I'm glad you brought it up because uh, I think lobbying has gotten a lot of bad press. <laughs> uh, l l lobbying, I would submit, is really not the problem. Uh, the, thank goodness we live in, in a, a, a country where uh, you can't, you do have access to your government at, for redress of grievances, as, as they say. Uh, and it's great that, that we have that access. So the problem is not that we have lobbyists mm -hmm. representing whoever they're representing. Uh, the problem is that uh, when they go to attempt to influence that elected official and persuade them that uh, this or that or the other thing would be a good thing to do, uh, it, it, w when the money starts getting involved in, in the whole process mm -hmm. and the elected officials decision depends more on how much money is involved or uh, either to be spent for them or against them in the next election as opposed to the merits of the arguments that the, that the lobbyist is making that's when it gets to be a problem right. uh, uh, thank goodness th I mean lo lobbyists we lobby we, right. we, go, we go to Sacramento and, and, and uh, city councils all, all the time uh, but we're, we're attempting to make our case based on the merits, not on how much money we can do. So let me ask this question relative to the money, because it is absolutely illegal for a politician to sell a vote. So what is, how, <laughs> can we talk about how the influence mm -hmm. occurs? Who wants to sell on it? Do you have a thought about, do you want to 
give us some sense as how, how does this influence occur to the degree that we're talking about? Well, I think when we talk about lobbying, we're really talking about the egregious effects of the revolving door. So the process by which a congressional staffer or a member of Congress um, really quickly transitions to working for a lobbying firm and parlaying their expertise on political processes into a high paying job. That person is definitely being courted while in office uh, by those high paying jobs and, and has sort of their foot out the door in most cases. Um, so, so there's this, you know, there's this cycle by which you get elected and then you move on to a much more lucrative career as a lobbyist. Who are you really representing when you're writing legislation? Who are you really thinking about? Are you thinking about your constituents in that moment or the people you're elected to serve? Or are you thinking about the person who is offering you a six-figure job as soon as you're, you're finished with your term? Um, I think that that's really um, the problem that we think of most when we think about lobbying and the way that, that legislation gets impacted in the most painful way um, is by being authored by or shepherded by people who are, are mostly perhaps influenced by um, you know, financial conflicts of interest that, that are largely in favor of the lobbyists. I think uh, among, among the most eloquent uh, uh, presentations on this issue was by John Paul Stevens in his reaction to the Citizens United decision, mm -hmm. where uh, he pointed out uh, really quite eloquently how the notion that this decision would not cause any appearance of corruption is ludicrous. Um, and uh, I mean, on, the, on the face of it. And you just hit a key word. It's, it's even the appearance that creates the problem in the mind of the, you know, Joe and Jane citizen, right. doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, it is the appearance, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's the appearance of corruption that undermines public trust in the institution of government. And, and that's what I think turns off voters and creates just this large scale apathy that, that we're now facing. There, there, there's a couple, if I may, there's a couple other things that, that I think uh, affect the way money gets involved in politics. One, as uh, Selena mentions, is, is the, the promise of a potential job, you know, later on down mm -hmm. the line, you know, uh, after your, your uh, elected service. But <clears throat> uh, any elected official, because the, they, they understand the, the importance of money and, and remaining in office and running for election, uh, they, they're they keenly aware of who the major donors are out there. So there doesn't have to be any official quid pro quo for them mm -hmm. to get. They know which side of their, their bread is buttered on right. and they know who's buttering it. Right. Well, what, what, one last thing, because this I, I, I very rarely hear talked about. The influence of money in politics uh, actually occurs much earlier in the process than we might think. Mm. When somebody's thinking about running for office, a group of people are thinking about running for office, and they come from a, a, a wide variety of political views, the, the moneyed powers, the powers that be, uh, are going to be hearing from those people, because one of the first things that they're going to be doing is reaching out to see, you know, can I get enough money to run a campaign and, and have a chance of getting elected? And so those moneyed powers basically pre-select, they're, they're going to choose to back whichever uh -huh. person they feel is already predisposed to do the sorts of things once elected that, that they would prefer to have done. So once that person ends up getting elected, you don't have to bribe them. They were already right. pre-selected. Be before the voters <laughs> even saw who was on the ballot, the fix was already in. <laughs> to that point, uh, there's an old movie called State of the Union. I believe that's the name of the movie with Spencer Tracy. Um, and. Uh, <coughs> He plays a guy who is an upstanding, very well-liked um, public figure who has been tabbed as the guy who they can buy. Uh -huh. And he, in fact, is bought, and he runs. And, of course, this is a Hollywood movie from the, the 40s, so it ends happily where he finally, at, at one point, he decides, I can't take it anymore, and he quits. Um, it's, uh, it's really uh, quite prescient in, mm -hmm. its, in its depiction of the... Uh, not only the appearance, but the actual corruption. Uh, well, we have, I don't, I'm not sure exactly how much time we have left in this episode, but, but we've talked a considerable amount here about this problem of the influence. So can we start to take a look at what might be potential solutions? So when I was up on the uh, Mayday Pack website earlier today, and there was a link to um, a page that had a list of, I guess it was five different uh, bills that are potentially in play in Congress, all of which are addressing some component 
of uh, campaign finance reform. But let's. What is it that that we think uh, might be solutions that we can look at to address this problem? So there, there is no silver bullet to this kind of problem, but there are a lot of things that you can be doing if you care about this issue to impact it now. I think that one of the most important ways is to get involved around the elections because so many people take their campaign finance reform common sense hat off and put on their political party hat and completely forget about this issue. But this is a time when the media is active, when this issue can be in the spotlight and when it's very important to, to make sure that it is. Um, so you know, there are pieces of legislation currently in Congress, the Government by the People Act, uh, introduced by Representative John Sarbanes in Maryland, um, has I, I think you know pretty impressive support on both sides of the aisle at this point. It is a piece of legislation that made APAC is really happy to support. Um, Fair Elections Now is also in the Senate, so that's a good litmus test for Senate candidates as well if you're interested in voting along those lines. There are pieces of legislation that have not been introduced, but that are really important potential remedies as well, including the American Anti-Corruption Act. Um, and I believe former Bush ethics advisor Richard Painter has also authored a potential remedy on the right. So there is no shortage of reforms out there. There is no shortage of, of activity you can engage in. I think that the most important thing, though, is to is to literally just do everything. Mm. <laughs> and yeah. I know that that sounds a little overwhelming, but um, but it is so important to do. There there are elections coming up that um, that we could be swaying on the basis of this. That's exactly what Mayday Pack is engaged in doing. Um, just this week, we were successful in uh, in getting 35 candidates for Congress. Um, to come out on the right side of reform just, just because we were threatening to campaign in their districts. Um, so there is immense power in, in making this issue your issue and in standing behind an effort that, that does that. So I would definitely encourage people to think through that very seriously. Um, I would be remiss uh, in my representation of Move to Amend if I didn't point out that there is another alternative, and that is to instruct the Supreme Court that its rulings don't apply, that they are incorrect. And the way you do that is, first of all, you pass an amendment that stipulates that money is not speech. An amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Constitution. Okay. So I have to I have to jump in here and say I don't think that that's an either or scenario. I, I think that passing an amendment is is definitely a part of the long term strategy. I, um, I get it. I yeah. get it. I understand. <laughs> I I preface this by saying that I would be remiss if I didn't include this element because it is in fact the major position of move to amend and it's twofold um, there was a supreme court decision in 1976 that in many respects pre it, it is far, far more far-reaching than citizens united or mccutcheon it, um, it is buckley versus vallejo it is the supreme court decision that affirmed that spending money is the exercise of free speech and so in fact regulation, campaign regulation, and really any legislation is subject to veto by the court because you are violating a, a person's constitutional right to free speech. So an amendment that states that speech is not, that money is not speech, is one thing. The other thing, we've really sort of just uh, touched around this, corporations have been uh, manipulating our uh, our governmental system by vetoing popularly passed laws by our legislatures, by Congress, because they supposedly violate their constitutional rights. Right. And that's another way in which the will of the people is being vetoed by large moneyed interests. So the move to amend amendment really focuses on two things. Mm -hmm. There's campaign finance, which is money is not speech, mm -hmm. and corporations or artificial entities do not have constitutional rights. Those are two ways in which the corruption really has become rampant. That, in conjunction with some of the other things that Selena said, I can see that it has to be a multi-pronged attack, and we only have about two or three minutes left in this segment of the show, so I'm gonna kinda summarize some things that I think we're talking about here. There is a substantial impact, uh, more so maybe today than we've seen in the last hundred years, uh, in the way that in our country, um, uh, finances, where the money comes from, has an impact on what happens to our, um, le our elected officials. 
And that doesn't matter whether they're Democrats or Republicans, conservatives, liberals, me, middle of the roaders, it doesn't matter. Okay, right. It's impacting them all and it's giving them a problem because as we've identified, they're not in a position to really do their job because they're out there searching for funds. So the fact that we're having this conversation here in August with elections coming up in November, I think is extremely cool because um, this, is going to be seen by a lot of hopefully a lot of people here in, in at least in the northern california area that we can maybe get a little bit of recognition here one of the th i've had some conversations with a number of people about um this kind of a topic frequently it it kind of degrades into a um an issues discussion which is most unfortunate mm -hmm. because this financing problem is issue agnostic Mm -hmm. And if we yeah, can fix that problem, that's good. then you have the opportunity for people to debate an issue without having to worry about where the money's coming from. Is that a reasonable d statement? D d democracy, actually, uh, as cumbersome as it is, actually works pretty <laughs> good when it's allowed to function. And so you, I think you could, you could sum up you know, pretty much everything that's wrong you know, right at the moment with our political system by saying that our, our, our democracy is dysfunctional. Our democracies at the moment is no longer able to function in the public interest. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I would be remiss if I didn't try to get in a quick plug for the California Disclose <laughs> Act, because <laughs> among the, the all, all these different things that we can do to affect the problem, one of the things we can do is help the voters see where all the money is coming from by disclosing in the ads who's actually funding We them. can talk a little bit more about that in the second segment, yeah. because okay. we do have another segment coming up. And Selena, yeah. I don't know if you'll be able to join us for that, but uh, it, it's been wonderful. Uh, your contribution is, has been very helpful, and thank you for joining us today. It was great to hear about the May Day Pack. Um, there's been the websites of the various um, organizations showing up on, on screen. So, folks, uh, if you have any interest in learning more about any of these topics, go up there, check out the data on their website. We're going to do another segment uh, on this uh, topic, and I'm very excited about that. If you have any questions for me or about this show, you can send those queries into info at referencepointtv.com. If it's about anything we're talking about, I'll get it to the right party here to answer it for you. If you have some ideas of a future show, you can send me that too. So, Etan, Craig, Selena, thank you so much for joining me here at Reference Point. And ladies and gentlemen, we'll see you next time.